Hi guys, welcome to another lesson for calculus. Uh, if you have yet to see the uh, AP Calc video about the test, how it's being updated this year, I recommend that you watch that before this. If you have seen that, you'll already realize that we've already covered everything that's gonna be on the modified AP Calc exam this year uh, in class. So we're really just gonna need to be reviewing some things as we work through this together. So what does that mean? Well, that means we're gonna be looking at a lot of review from the beginning of class to now. Uh, we don't have a lot of time before the test, uh, about four or five weeks, but that should give us enough time to briefly hit on all the major topics of Calc. So we're gonna start here with lesson one with limits. I know it's been forever since we've talked about limits, so we might want to first realize and write down a definition of what a limit actually is. So what is a limit? The limit is the y value of a function. So the y value a function approaches. So the y value that a function approaches, that's a particular word that we need. As you get closer to a given x value. So the limit again is just a y value that we get close to as we approach a certain x value. We're gonna look at limits a lot today, well, the only thing we're gonna look at today. We're gonna look at them in a number of different ways, graphically and algebraically, and figuring out how we can use both graphs and our algebraic skills to evaluate limits. So first off, graphically is the easiest because we can actually physically see the value that the function is approaching as we get closer to certain x values. Let's remind ourselves of the notation. This LIM is our limit notation. And this bottom part says x is approaching negative one. And this little plus sign means I'm looking just from the right-hand side for numbers that are greater than negative one. So I'm gonna circle that plus sign. That means I want to look at when x is approaching negative 1, but just from the right-hand side. So if I go here, I can find x equals negative 1 right here on my graph. And if I want to look for numbers that are greater than negative 1, that's over here on the right-hand side. So I want to follow the graph. This is a funky piecewise graph of this function up here. And if I follow the line as I get closer in x, to negative one from the right hand side, I see that I go along this path right here. That means the y value that I'm approaching, even if my function is not defined there, my limit doesn't care, the y value that I'm approaching here is four, positive four. Because on the right hand side of my graph, my function is getting closer and closer to four as and in a y value, as my x value gets closer and closer to negative 1 from the right. Let's look at graphically the second one over here. Here I have another piecewise function. And I have limit as x approaches negative 1. But this is a full limit now. I don't have a plus or a minus. This means from both sides do I approach a certain value for this function. This looks gross. So let's go ahead down and just look at the graph. I'm gonna to wanna to find negative one again, which is right here. And I wanna see what happens on either side. On the left-hand side, my function does this and approaches a certain y value. It looks like it approaches a value of negative one on the left-hand side. However, on the right-hand side, I have this upside down parabola and as I approach negative one from the right-hand side, it looks like I get close to a value of negative three. Because my function approaches two different values from either side, I say that this limit does not exist because the right and the left-hand limits are not the same. For this, there's a big giant jump, which means we don't have a limit. If I were to look at a graph that had any kind of um, like spikiness in it, um, like any cusps, 
That's fine for limits as long as the function approaches the same value from the right-hand side and from the left-hand side. Okay, I'm going to go down here and look at a couple of more examples. So the graph of f is shown here. And I want to know for what values of a does the limit as x approach, approaches that value of a equal 2. So I want to see where do I see in this graph that on both sides of, uh, of the value, my graph is getting closer to 2. So here's my y value of 2. And I'm going to kind of extend this to help me see where my function looks like 2. There should be a couple different places that I get here. There's not just one answer. Take a minute, see if you can, pause the video, see if you can find the places, the a values, where if you take the limit as x approaches that value, you get 2. Okay. After you took a minute to pause the video and look here, I can see that I want the, the function to look at this value. And so I see that right here, I've got this semicircular part, and I've got this linear part. And even though the function's not defined at that point, it's defined all the way up here, from both sides, my function is approaching this value of 2. So I can say that at this x value, or a value here, if a approaches 3, the limit as x approaches a, or x approaches 3, gives me 2 at this point, even though I do have a hole here. Right here I have a big jump, so I'm not going to look at it. I know the limit's not existing here. But I see here as well, from both the left-hand side and the right-hand side, my function is approaching this value of 2, even though, again, it is not defined here. So at a equals 8, I should also have the limit equaling 2. Great. Let's move on quickly. You can take a pause if you need a mental break, but I'm going to keep moving because yeah, I'm here. So for direct substitution limits, if I've got algebraic limits on the back, for lots of limits, I can just go ahead and try and directly substitute into my function if I'm given my uh, limit algebraically. So if I want to know the limit as x approaches 2 of this function, well, I just want to know the y value when x equals 2. So I just go ahead and plug in 2 into this function. So I get 2 cubed minus 2 squared minus 4. That gives me a limit of 0. So even without graphing it, algebraically, I know that that function is approaching 0 from both the right and left hand sides. If I look at the next one, I can also go ahead and plug this in. There's a negative out front. I want to approach this x value of 1. That's why this is where I'm finding where I'm plugging what value of x I'm plugging in. So I want to plug in wherever I see x. I'm going to plug in 1. And I'm going to make sure I put parentheses around all of my values I'm plugging in to be super safe, just in case there's negative values. And what you should end up seeing here is negative, and I believe the top is negative 3. The bottom is 3. Negative 3 over 3 is negative 1, but there's a negative out front, so my value should approach positive 1 here. My little note here is just plug it in. Just plug in your x value. If you can, and I get a nice number, we're good. My last example, just to work with some more confusing fractions and radicals, I've got negative square root 2 times my x value of 3 halves plus 4. This 2 and this 2, the uh, 2 out front and the 2 in the denominator, are going to cancel. So I get negative square root of 3 plus 4, which is just giving me negative square root of 7. So there's a couple examples in the classwork like that as well, where you're just plugging in those values. But that's too easy. The AP exam is not going to do that too much. I'm assuming they're going to look more at removable discontinuities and continuities at, or uh, limits at infinity. So removable discontinuities, what does this mean? If I try to plug in negative 4 onto the top and the bottom here, my numerator will give me 0. And my denominator will also give me 0. If I try and plug in the value here, I'm going to get something gross. 
Lots of times when you have fractions like this, it will end up being zero on the top, zero on the bottom. So I can use L'Hopital's rule, if you remember that, you may re uh, review that in a little bit as well uh, in a later lesson. But for some of these ones, it might just be easier to see if we can factor. So I'm going to keep my limit notation and see if I can rewrite this limit up here in an easier way. So I know I can factor the top. It's a simple quadratic to factor. It should factor the x plus 4 and x minus 6. Numbers that multiply to negative 24 add to negative 2. And on the bottom, I'm just going to factor out that common factor of 2. When I do that, I can cancel out the x plus 4 it's pretty, uh, pretty easily. And I get, again, keeping this limit notation all the way through, limit as x approaches negative 4 of x minus 6 over 2. And once I'm ready to plug in this value of x, I can go ahead and get rid of the limit notation. I get negative 4 minus 6 over 2, which should give me negative 5. Cool. For this next one, I've got limit as x approaches 0. And I see that these aren't really quadratics. I've got cortex here. I've got x to the fourth power. But what I do see is that every single term has a power of x squared in it that I can factor out. So if I factor out that x squared, I should get this from my numerator, x squared times 5x squared plus 8. And I get x squared times 3x squared minus 16 for my denominator, where the x's will cancel. Then I'm just going to go ahead and plug x equals 0 into this function here. And these x terms are going to cancel, x squared terms. So I should just get 8 over negative 16 or negative 1 half. When I plug in the 0 here, I plugged in x equals 0, because that's what I'm looking at here. Sometimes you may have to actually factor out the top and the bottom. I'm going to go ahead and go through this one pretty quickly because I know you guys can factor pretty well. So I get x minus 3 and x minus 1 on the top. I get x plus 4 and x minus 1 on the bottom. The x minus 1 should cancel because, again, this is where my original function was bad. Every single one of these, if I plug in this value initially, gives me 0 on the top and 0 on the bottom. 0 on the top and 0 on the bottom. Because of that, that means I can cancel these things out. And I eventually get the limit as x approaches 1 of x minus 3 over x plus 4. But if I plug in 1, I just get 1 minus 3, 1 plus 4. That should give me negative 2. This. Sorry. I'll move the work up here. I was too excited about the math to realize it was off the screen a little bit. Okay, the last thing that I want to review quickly, I know there's a lot of stuff, but there's a lot of stuff in unit one, and we don't have a lot of time to review. Um, so for limits at infinity, that means what happens as x gets close to plus or minus infinity? So when I'm looking at limits at infinity, I'm looking at what's happening as x gets really, really big or really, really small. One thing I will go back and add back in here, our key here for some of these ones was just always factoring. So our key for the removal of discontinuities was factoring. OK, so limit time infinity, I've got a graphical example and two algebraic examples. So graphically, it's saying, what's the limit? What's the y value as x gets closer to negative infinity? So when my x value gets close to negative infinity, I'm all the way on this side of my graph. And I can see that I'm getting really, really close to 0. I'm getting close to the line y equals 0. So I can tell just from this graph that my limit here is 0. How can I tell that algebraically? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to compare the uh, size of the numerator and the denominator as x gets really, really big. So let me actually go to the bottom of this one to show you what it looks like algebraically. So if I'm looking at the limit as x approaches negative infinity, I want to see what is my largest term in the numerator and what is my smallest term, or sorry, my largest term in the denominator when I'm comparing. So I know when x gets really big, x is way bigger than 2. 
And when I'm getting really big, x squared is really big, is much bigger than x and one. So this limit is about the same thing as the limit of x over x squared. I just get rid of the smaller terms and just focus on the biggest one, because infinity squared is way bigger than infinity in my denominator. So this is about then limit as x approaches negative infinity of one over x, because I can cancel out one of these x's here. And if I have one over a huge number, even if it's negative, that's pretty much going to be zero. One over negative one billion is about zero. It's negative point zero 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 zero. All those zeros, one. So it's about zero. For these ones where I don't have a graph to help me and I have to use the algebraic method, I'm again going to focus on just the biggest terms in the top and the bottom. Thankfully, my numerator only has one term. And in my denominator, I can see that x squared is going to be much bigger than negative 4 when I get really, really big x values. These x's will cancel. And I just get the limit as x approaches negative infinity of 2. Well, this is just a flat line. This function 2 is just a flat line at y equals 2. So the y value it approaches is 2. So if I can cancel all the x's out, my limit is actually just that number. And last, we're going to look at limit as x approaches infinity of x cubed over 4x squared plus 3. I know that my numerator's largest term is x cubed because it's the only one. And my denominator's largest term is 4x squared. I can cancel out two of the x's, let's see, put approximation symbols here. And so this is the limit as x approaches infinity of x over 4. And if I plug that in, I'm going to get infinity divided by 4, which is just the same thing as infinity. So this limit goes on forever towards positive infinity. Great. So I'm going to pause here. These are some great examples. You can rewatch the video if you need to see these examples in more detail. I know I go fast. That's because you can rewatch these videos now. So you can rewatch them, pause them, slow them down, speed them up, etc., to help yourself out with that. Uh, attached along with this, you'll see a classwork assignment and an uh, exit ticket for you to fill out. Uh, all that I ask for you is so it's easier for me to know when everything's turned in is even though this Google form that you're going to fill out for your exit ticket is not something you're submitting on that document. You're just uh, not something you're submitting in Google Classroom. It's something that you're filling out on the Google form. Is that you still press the turn in with no attachments on it, just so I know that, hey, you completed this assignment, and I should be expecting to see that uh, Google form, that exit ticket, in my uh, mailbox, in my Google Drive, where you submitted your, um, your exit ticket there. Uh, other than that, hopefully you have a good rest of the day. If you've got any questions about this stuff, I'll be in office hours uh, from 2.45 to 3.45. Hope to see you there. Have a good one, guys. Bye.